Hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOC on Applied Electromagnetics for Engineers. In this module, we begin the discussion of waveguides. We have already seen one way of conveying information that is the transmission line. So, a transmission line we have seen that also supports transverse electromagnetic wave or if we have not seen that we will see that one shortly. But a transmission line structure is conventionally different from a waveguide structure because a transmission line requires a pair of conductors whether it was a two wire conductor that we talked about or the microstrip that we have not talked about but showed uh, you that or the coaxial cable that we talked about you know any of the uh, transmission line structures are differentiated from the waveguide structures by having two conductors at least a pair of two conductors you can actually have multiple conductors so that becomes what is called as a multi conductor transmission line something that we would not be talking about it here. So, why do we need waveguides if we already have transmission lines? Unfortunately, if we have transmission lines, the structure of a transmission line is such that if you take a two wire line, there is a nice separation between the two wires and any of the external electromagnetic fields can actually interfere with that. Okay. Moreover, the geometry of the transmission line that we consider determines the inductance and the capacitance of these structures as we have already seen right so we have evaluated capacitance of a few transmission line structures we have evaluated inductance of a few transmission line structures and because these inductance and capacitances eventually you know show a frequency dependent behavior the bandwidth of these structures as the frequency of operation starts to increase the response of this drops out and hence they have a bandwidth which is defined uh, depending on what transmission line structure that you are considering. The bandwidth could be a few hundreds of megahertz or it could be up to about say 3 gigahertz or a very well designed coaxial cables can work up to 5 to 10 gigahertz. But beyond that if you try to increase the frequency of operation these transmission line structures simply cannot you know convey information because of what happens you know because of the technical thing as what is called as a higher order mode propagation that is there will be additional modes which are not present when the frequency is low that these frequencies these additional modes rather start to propagate and they will corrupt the signal or rather bring down the bandwidth. Okay. So, you have to redesign these transmission line structures such that you either emphasize those higher order modes which anyway start to propagate at very high frequencies or you try to eliminate them. Because eliminating is not possible, you try to make the best scenario out of this. You actually design structures such that for a certain frequency range, you know up to a certain frequency range there would not be any propagation, but once you start propagating or once you exceed the frequency minimum frequency or the cutoff frequency, then multiple modes can actually propagate. The advantage here is that you are actually pushing the range of operation anywhere from 10 gigahertz all the way up to 100 gigahertz or slightly more than that in some cases. Okay. So, what you have is a very interesting uh, you know um, structure which will be different from the transmission line structure because this structure will have only a single conductor and this single conductor structure as we will see will not be able to support transverse electromagnetic waves. Okay but they will support higher order modes and the advantage is that they go much beyond than what is possible with a simple transmission line structures okay, in terms of the frequency of operation. So, we will look at uh, in this model we will just give you a brief idea of what these uh, waveguides are and give you couple of ideas as to how to relate at least one of the waveguides to a transmission line. Okay and show you uh, what, what should be the procedure in order to analyze these waveguide structures and from the next module we will actually analyze the common waveguide structures. Okay. Before we even talk about waveguides, here is a problem that we have already seen. Okay. So, I have an interface, so let us say on the right hand side of this interface is a nice conductor. For the moment I will assume it to be a perfect electric conductor which means there is no tangential electric field on the boundary. Let us also call this as the x axis and the incident wave propagating along the z axis. I do not want to choose a normal incidence, I want to choose a oblique incidence in this case. So, let me choose an oblique incidence at an angle of theta i. Okay. 
because the right hand side is a conductor obviously no electromagnetic wave propagates into the second medium and whatever the incident EM wave that you have would simply be reflected back at the same angle of you know incidence the angle of reflection is the same angle at the angle of refraction. The moment you have a obliquely incident light you have a choice between TE and TM mode and I will choose in this particular case to work with TE modes because they are slightly simple to understand the concept without getting too much into mathematical details. So, for the TE case the electric field will be along the y direction. So, the incident light will be or incident wave will be along the y direction. So, let us call this as E y i and this k vector you know which is at an angle theta i we already know how to decompose this k i vector or the incident k i vector into the magnitude of the vector k i times some cos theta i along z axis. So, there is a z component plus k i sin theta i along the x component and obviously this magnitude of k i is given by whatever the frequency that we have here times square root of mu epsilon where mu and epsilon are the permeability and permittivity of the medium of incidence over here. So, this first medium that we are considering. Since light is reflected or wave is reflected, so the reflected wave also is assumed to be in the is polarized along the y direction itself and the reflected wave vector k r will have the same magnitude as the incident wave vector obviously because it is in the same medium. Only thing is its sign along z direction will change because the wave is now propagating away from the z direction. So, there will be a minus sign to this one and I have used the same angle theta i here theta i here. So, let me eliminate all these angles and let me also eliminate any you know denoting this one by i. So, I will have to rewrite this one. So, this would be k cos theta z where theta i equals to theta which is also equal to theta r and this would be k sin theta z where the magnitude of the k vector is omega square root mu epsilon. The reflected one will have the magnitude of k, but it would be at a minus sign with respect to z plus k sin theta along x. Okay. What is the boundary condition? Well, the boundary condition is that the total tangential electric field in the first medium must be equal to 0. That means, E y incident plus E y r reflected must be equal to 0. There are no tangential electric fields on the second region. Okay. And what is E y i? It will have some magnitude. So, let us say E y uh, or E 0 is the magnitude of this electric field, incident electric field. The phase factor will be of course, this condition will be the boundary condition is actually kept at z equal to 0 or actually have to be done at z equal to 0. So, you have E 0 e power minus j k cos theta z e power minus j k sin theta x correct. So, this is the incident one and when you evaluate this one at z equal to 0, you will have E 0 e power minus j k sin theta x for the incident wave for the reflected wave the amplitude would be so let us say E 0 prime is the amplitude of the reflected wave. So, this would be E power E 0 prime E power j k cos theta z this of course, at z equal to 0 there is also E power minus j k sin theta x. Okay. So, this will give you E 0 prime E power minus j k sin theta x. The sum of these two should be equal to 0 obviously, if this has to be valid for every point in x, this should be equal to I mean that should not be existing and E 0 prime must be equal to minus E 0. right? So, the total electric field in the region 1 can be written as a field which is y directed because that is the field that we have considered E 0 E power minus j k sin theta x and instead of writing k sin theta, I will write this one as k x times x where it is understood that k x is magnitude k times cos theta and what about the you know the phase factor for the z. Well, you have for the incident field e power minus j k z z right and for the reflected field minus e power j k z z right. So, all the other things are the same except that we have a minus sign over here. Now, this is nothing but minus 2 j 
sin k z into z of course this is at z you know less than in the in the sense that away from the interface okay so away from the interface the total electric field actually has a very interesting scenario so it will i mean interesting uh, expression you have minus 2j some complex number e0 sin k z into z e power minus j k x into x okay so look at this if you want to sketch the magnitude of the total electric field i would like to sketch that one as a function of z over there at z equal to 0 obviously this would be equal to 0 and as the value of z you know as you move away from the interface at some distance k z into z equal to some distance d so if i am sketching this one as a function of k z times z at k z or rather if i am sketching this one as a function of z at some distance z such that z equal to d again you might have a situation where k z into d will be equal to some multiple of pi correct so when this happens when the wave vector along z times the distance d from the interface is equal to m pi the magnitude of the electric field again goes to 0 or rather the electric field there goes to 0 so i am sketching the magnitude but the total electric field there goes to 0 it does not stop at this point you can actually continue this one so this first 0 happened at d from the interface z equal to 0 or minus d in case you are uh, you know in case you want to be very specific i mean at another distance which let us say is 2d which is the multiple of this one the electric field goes to 0 again okay now imagine that i actually have kept one more perfect electric conductor at this point okay so i already had an perfect electric conductor here at z equal to 0 which was my original interface now i have placed another perfect electric conductor at this point where the distance between the two perfect electric conductors is now d right now here is a very interesting question does the electric field realize that there is been a second perfect electric conductor the electric field does not even realize that there is a second perfect electric conductor because anyway it would have gone down to 0 there the electric field would have gone to 0 there just because we placed a perfect electric conductor means that we have not changed the boundary condition at all and it does not have to be that you have to place this perfect electric conductor at d you can place it at 2d 3d 4d whatever so wherever those integral multiples of d that you place provided that you keep all the other things constant that is the angle theta to be constant then the electric field and the corresponding magnetic fields automatically satisfy the boundary condition okay and in case you also make instead of these two wires if you make them two plates okay so if you make these two as two plates which extend all the way along the x direction and along the y direction but then they are separate by a distance d along the z axis then you will realize that even more interesting scenario or even more interesting thing that the wave actually shows oscillations along the x direction that is there is a phase factor e power minus j k x x which when you go back and write down the real uh, you know z, x and t x z and t kind of a thing you will see that this would be cos omega t minus k x x right so is not it amazing that the wave although was incident and then got reflected the resulting wave is actually transmitted or is it gui it is guided or it is propagating along the x axis that is along the interface direction this is actually you know propagating so this structure supports propagation of the electric fields and of course the magnetic fields which we have not written here but it does support the magnetic field as well when you analyze it in the t e case or tm case you will see that just by having two parallel plates which are separate there will be wave propagation inside and this wave propagation of course depends on the angle of incidence and as the angle of incidence changes there will be some situations where the electric field automatically goes to zero right but there are other situations where it does not go to zero when it does not go to zero the field would definitely see a different uh, you know uh, try to it will be different so sin k z z z will be the way the field is actually going back but then if the second perfect electric conductor is not placed in the appropriate position then it won't be able to satisfy the boundary condition and the condition that there is a pc on the same on on that particular distance so because of that for those angles theta there won't be any propagation but when you have the angle theta adjusted such that there is a boundary condition satisfied 
at the position where you keep the second perfect electric conductor, then that particular uh, angle of incidence, light incident or the electromagnetic wave incident at that angle of incidence actually propagates along the interface or it is guided by the two parallel plates. Okay. This is an example of what is called as a parallel plate wave guide. Okay. Because it allows light of different modes and these modes are the ones which satisfy this angle. So, all those angles k z uh, times d uh, or you know the kz times d must satisfy the condition that it must be equal to some odd multiple or even multiple of pi right so that the sine function the sine of kzz automatically satisfies the boundary conditions on the said perfect electric conductor those angles will be spaced at discrete values they won't be continuous angles so those angles which you know satisfy this condition will also allow propagation of electromagnetic waves incident at those angles and those angles uh, or those uh, uh, electromagnetic waves at those angles are called as modes. Okay. So, we say that parallel plate waveguide supports multiple modes. The lowest order mode turns out to be what is called as TEM, which is what I would like to talk about in the remainder of this module. Okay. This gives you a nice different point of view. Let us go back to the parallel plate waveguide, but this time I will change the coordinate conditions because it is common to consider propagation along z direction rather than propagation along x direction. So, this time I consider two plates which go all the way to infinity or extend all the way to infinity as well as infinity on two sides, one along the x direction along the y direction okay, and uh, one along the x direction and along the z direction. They are separated along the y direction. So, you actually have a separation along the y direction by an amount of d. Okay. So, let us just put an amount of d as a separation and these are the two parallel plate waveguides that I am considering. Okay. So, these are the two waveguides that we have. The separation between the two is d along the y plane. So, this might be equal to y equal to 0, y equal to d. Do not worry about y, whether it is y equal to 0 here, y equal to d there or y equal to 0 on the top plate and y equal to 0 on the bottom plate, minus d on the bottom plate. Okay. So, this axis is along the y axis that we have considered, this is the x axis. Okay. Because along x axis this would be infinite, it would rather be difficult for us to treat this infinite concepts. Okay. So, what we do is we only pick a portion A along the x direction and work with that finite length portion. Okay. We do not really lose anything because of the fact that this is infinite. I can just pick off a particular region and see what is the electric magnetic fields and everything per unit length and then I can work back to that. Okay. Along z I have, so this let us say is the z direction that I consider. So, along z is the direction in which the waves are supposed to be propagating. Well, what kind of waves are supposed to be propagating? First of all, look at this thing. So, because these two plates are kept at two, you know like they are kept at a distance and if there is a wave, which direction should the wave be present? Well, if I pick a small strip here, okay, so I pick a strip over here, the electric field because of the fact that this is a perfect conductor, the y equal to 0 is a perfect conductor, the electric field must be directed from one conductor to another conductor. If I arbitrarily choose that this conductor from which the electric field originates as the bottom conductor, then I have the electric fields to be uniform and originating from the bottom conductor and reaching all the way to the top conductor. So, equivalently what I you know have kind of assumed is that there are these positive charges in this strip down here and there are these negative charges on the top plate. So, essentially we have a positive charge here, negative charge here, so that the electric field lines are along the y direction and they would be going into uh, going from one plate to the other plate. Okay. Now, if I consider this same strip here, okay, so if I consider this strip and ask you what is the total flux that is enclosed by this strip, which actually is at z and z plus dz that is the strip has a width of dz and a length of a. What is the total amount of electric flux that is enclosed by this? The amount of electric flux let us call this as psi electric is equal to epsilon e y 
the strip width is A into dz. Okay. Why should it be epsilon Ey? Because the electric field lines are uniform and originating along, I mean, and, and oriented along the y direction. Epsilon times electric field will be the flux density. Flux density times the area of this green strip will be A into dz and this is the total electric flux density. Of which, if I now assume Ey to be time varying, then the displacement current which is di d psi electric flux by dt must be in the phasor form be equal to j omega epsilon Ey A dz. Okay. So, this is the total displacement current that is because of these arrows, the black arrows that we have written, these arrows are varying with respect to time only in magnitude, the orientation is always along y direction. Okay. Now, on the same strip, if I apply Ampere's law here, okay, so by going through this particular path, okay, so what do I get? Along this path, the magnetic field is H and let us say it is oriented along the x direction. So, this is Hx of z plus dz and this would be Hx of z itself. So, you can look at the way the fields and other things are oriented and you can show that when you apply the integral h dot dl right which must then be equal to the displacement current as we will show sh I mean as we know that one. So, if you apply this integral of h dot dl you will get hx at z plus dz times a that is because that is the length of the strip. The perpendicular direction that is along z there is no h component. Okay, We have assumed that electric field is along y and magnetic field is only along x component. So, you have hx z plus dz a minus hx of z times a this must be equal to j omega epsilon e y a dz. Obviously, a cancels out on all uh, on the right hand side and the left hand side and it must because we have as we said we are cons going to consider a strip of a, but our results will be independent of this a here. Okay. So, at this point the results will be independent of a. Now, let me consider a different kind of a strip. Okay. I have a parallel plate waveguide. Okay, so, I have a parallel plate waveguide coming off like this, but this time I consider a strip. So, let me consider the strip here and this time the strip that I consider will be like this. Okay, so, this is the strip that I am going to consider. The width of this strip will be again should be in this direction. So, the width of this strip is dz, but the height of this strip will be b. Okay. So, what is the total magnetic flux coming out of this? So, h is along the x direction. So, what is the total magnetic flux coming around? So, let us call this as phi mag and this magnetic flux will be mu h x which is the magnetic flux density b vector times b dz will be the width of this strip. So, it will be b times dz. Okay. And now, if I apply uh, appropriately oriented uh, loop here. So, if I apply the appropriately oriented loop around this particular loop, if I apply integral of E dot dl that must be equal to minus j omega magnet phi mag. Right? So, this would be the total uh, you know the magnetic or the magnetic flux and then the rate of change of magnetic flux would be the EMF induced over this closed contour E. Of course, E on this uh, path will be evaluated at z plus dz, whereas on this path must be evaluated as z itself. Okay. So, when you apply this one, so you can see that this would be b times e y of z minus b times e y of z plus dz, this must be equal to minus j omega mu h x b dz. Okay. Again, the equation will be independent of b here. Okay. So, you can remove b from both sides. And now, if you divide both sides by delta z or rather dz and let this dz go to uh, you know whatever the uh, 0 out there, the left hand side will be a differential uh, uh, of e y with respect to z. And similarly, if you differentiate on both sides by or divide both sides by dz and then let dz go to 0, the left hand side will be d h x of z by dz. Right? So, if I do this one, I obtain two equations. So, one will be d h x of z divided by d z equal to j omega epsilon times e y and similarly, I obtain d e y by d z okay, 
to be equal to j omega mu hx. So, these equations are the equations that govern how the electric field and the magnetic field along this particular parallel plate waveguide would change. Okay. Just one last thing, we know that voltage is electric field times the length along which you are actually calculating the voltage. So, if you pick the lower and the upper four plates and then pick a particular value of z, then the corresponding potential difference at the point z between the lower and the upper plates will actually be equal to the electric field that would exist at that particular point times the difference between the two plates. So, this is volt per meter into meter therefore, that would essentially be the voltage difference. Similarly, the current from Ampere's law earlier we have seen that the current here at a particular z where dz can be thought of vanishingly going to 0 be equal to minus a hx of z. Okay. So, because I know voltage, I know current, I can go and replace in terms of E y, I mean replace E y z in terms of V that would be V of z by B. Similarly, I replace hx of z as minus I of z by A. When I do that one, I obtain two equations. So, one equation will be di of z by dz which tells you how the current is changing okay? and this is equal to minus j omega A epsilon times E y, but that is actually equal to minus j omega epsilon A by B V of z and then you have d V of z by dz equal to minus j omega mu B by A times I of z. Okay? So, these equations remind you of the fact or remind you of the form that this is some y and this is some z, you know the impedance series impedance z and this is the series ad or the shunt admittance y. Therefore, the propagation constant of these two voltages and the currents will be equal to square root of z into y and that would be equal to in this case because a by b cancels out with b by a and minus j and minus j would I mean if I do not even have to consider the minus j and minus j let me just consider the absolute value over here. So, omega square mu epsilon is what you will get. So, this would be square root of omega square mu epsilon which is omega square root mu epsilon. So, you see that your field components E y and H x both propagate with a velocity given by 1 by square root mu epsilon and they have a lossless propagation of propagation constant omega square root mu epsilon. Okay. In fact, I would also ask you to find out what is the characteristic impedance. There you will see that the characteristic impedance also depends on the ratio of B by A. Okay. I mean in uh, it would not happen in gamma, but it does happen in the propagation sorry characteristic impedance of this particular thing. What I would like to conclude is that a parallel plate waveguide is a very special type of a waveguide. Okay. It can support transverse electromagnetic waves where the electric field is along y depends only on z, the magnetic field is along x depends only on z. Okay. And this TEM wave propagates with a velocity that is independent of the frequency. But as the frequency is increased, okay, then it is possible that the same transmission, I mean the same parallel plate waveguide actually supports higher order modes. Okay. And these higher order modes are called as the T e higher order modes or T m higher order modes depending on this so called oblique wave incidence analysis that we have done. Granted in both viewpoints we have not really looked at how the fields for the higher order modes actually exist and in order to do that when we have to solve Maxwell's equations and then apply appropriate boundary conditions which is what we are going to do in the next module. But the point is that the transmission line structure and the equations that we wrote are actually relatable to the electromagnetic wave propagation that we have discussed and that is the key point. Okay. But when the frequency increases the parallel plate waveguide structure or the parallel plate structure cannot just support TEM but higher order modes. In fact, that is the point where we say that the parallel wire or the parallel plate waveguide has lived to its utility and we do not really consider it to be useful when higher order modes start to propagate okay, because there will be excessive loss out there. Okay. To overcome this is what we go for a different type of a waveguide or a proper waveguide and the example that we will be looking at in the next class is that of the rectangular waveguide. Thank you very much.